Hey readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're watching Fictitious, a show about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. In this episode, I'm talking with Essa Hansen, author of Nofic Gloss. This debut science fiction adventure follows Caden, a teenage mechanic who discovers his simple but highly regimented life is actually one of servitude on a hidden slave planet. When his entire colony is sent to slaughter, Caden alone survives, fleeing the vicious creatures who devoured his people. After taking refuge in a strange abandoned vessel, he is saved from capture by a band of explorers and whisked off planet with only trauma and rage as mementos of his previous existence. Among the stars, he discovers a multiverse of strange life forms, alien cultures, and incredibly powerful foes. Torn by grief and guilt, accompanied by a quarrelsome found family, and in possession of a dangerously unique ship, Caden wrestles with his own mysterious origins while facing a singular question. How can one boy take revenge on a vast, evil interstellar political entity? Nova Gloss is an ambitious and imaginative space opera novel that arrives on November 17th from Orbit Books. Vanessa, welcome to Fictitious. Thank you so much for having me on. So I'm excited to get you on the show because, um, well, one, because the, the book is super rad, but also because we got a chance to talk uh, on uh, the New York Comic Con at home panel uh, a few weeks back, which was really fun. We were joined by a really amazing lineup of authors. Um, how does it feel for you as a debut novelist to be featured in some of these chats alongside other debut authors, alongside people who have like dozens of novels out and to be doing it all amidst, you know, just the weirdest possible time to be coming out with a book. I'm not going to lie. It's intimidating. <laughs> and also <laughs> I'm not someone super comfortable with um, video recording or voice recording. So I've had that hurdle to get over as well, try and get comfortable in front of the camera and, and um, speaking my ideas clearly. <laughs> Um, but it's really made me realize how bad I am at articulating my own story when it like has to be to someone else. <laughs> like I know everything in my brain, but to actually, you know, express it clearly, um, all the tangles in my head of the world and the sto and the character and the themes is is really hard. You can hear me now stumbling over it. <laughs> it's like it's, it's too big to get out and like how do people words? <laughs> you know, that's the 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 thing. I saw a great tweet about this other day. I forget who who put it out there, but they were like uh author labors over a 100,000 word novel sends off to agent. Agent's like, "Great, now sum it up in two sentences." <laughs> like, how do you do that, right? Like mm -hmm. it's such a and and I I mean, I think you hit it there too, like these things are this this huge expansive thing in your head. You've spent all this time writing it, crafting it, revising it, turning it to something that that people can enjoy. And and I'm certain that the world is three times larger in your head than what even hits the page, particularly when you're working on a trilogy and more books to follow. Um, so summing it up is difficult. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask for your elevator pitch and find out exactly how you're supposed to do that. And if you've gotten used to it yet after, you know, a couple of months of, of doing all this stuff. Yeah, so No Fed Glass is about a young man whose planet is destroyed for economic gain. He's thrust into a vast bubble multiverse and forced to grow up too quickly, physically, emotionally, and morally as he seeks out justice. That's my, like, one-line pitch. <laughs> That's but great. More, That's summed up really well. Yeah, it took a while. <laughs> and the, more, <laughs> the more events like this and podcasts and interviews that I do, the more I get used to putting my ideas and and. And figuring out the themes and the concepts that are the most like key and the most interesting that people want to hear about and focusing on those. So I don't get sort of lost in like, what do I talk about? Like, I have so many answers for this question. Like, what, which one do I pick? So now I'm sort of narrowing down, I think, to like, you know, having the one, one or two things for the questions that come up a lot. Like, what's your inspiration? Like, well, how did you come up with this? Or those sorts of questions easier the more I do these. Um, but on panels, like with with veteran authors, 
a lot of them are so well spoken and have seem to have such a firm grasp of their world and their message um, that it trips me up too because I'm like, wow, I wish I wish I could get there one day. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you said, it's 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 all about experience, and I think you know. I, it used to be, I think, when people were authors, they were like, okay, I go into my cave, I write my stories, I do it from my happy place of introversion, and then I put them out into the world, and then I go back work on the next book. And uh, in this day and age, that's not part of the deal. I mean, if, especially if you're a traditionally published author and you're part of that promotional cycle, being out there, putting yourself out there, speaking and appearing and being on, you know, now on videos and stuff, but also at panels and shows, it's all part of the deal. So it's all part of writing craft at this point. I, there was a, a a tweet that I keep referencing Twitter because I live way too much in that space. But there was a tweet that I saw a while back that was like, oh, to be an author, you need this. And it was this laundry list of things. It was like, you need to write books and be revising and be promoting and, uh, and be a speaker and be able to do your website and be a cartographer to do maps for your fantasy novel and all this list of things and uh and and i looked at it as both like uh like oh my gosh that's that's just crazy why would you expect one person to be that and then i was like ooh i'm actually like 7 out of that 10 i think i can get there <laughs> but um but it's got to be so daunting just to be like oh this is the stuff that i have to do now it's like it's absolutely crazy you mentioned in there um, yeah, just talking about themes and figuring out the themes in your stories. And I want to know what drew you to the themes in this novel, because even as we know that, um, you know, it, this is a science fiction novel, it's, it's, it's a space opera, it's, it is, to a certain extent, kind of reads a little bit like hard sci-fi, just because of the nature of all the tech and stuff that you put into it. But this is really a story about trauma and loss and coming of age uh, to a certain extent. Uh, you, you can hit on some of the tropes like fish out of water and things like that as well. But really, I mean, this is about one kid trying to cope with losing everything and figuring out how to align the rest of his life around either dealing with it moving on or focusing, focusing himself entirely on essentially revenge and retribution. Um, so when you were coming up with this idea, were those themes in there from the beginning or were they things that kind of developed out over time uh, as you were like fashioning the novel? Yeah, so I have the inciting incident is like a really powerful event and the themes evolved just from the psychology, exploring the psychology of that um, and exploring, you know, his, how his mindset changes and how he, he tries to grow up while also outrunning the the weight of this grief and anger at this event that happened. So starting sort of small and really focal, I think built the themes out naturally from there. So I didn't have to plan it out ahead of time. I could just sort of follow my character as I was learning the world. Um, but I, I knew that I wanted a protagonist who felt uprooted, um, didn't have culture or community or family and struggled with belonging and identity because those are themes that um, are really special to me and always interesting. And every character is going to be a little different. Um, but I wanted him to sort of be adrift. And then I had always intended to try an ensemble cast as a challenge for myself. And so that goes hand in hand with the found family theme. And I also knew that I wanted the messiness of like a wrench thrown into a well-oiled machine. So this crew has been together for a long time. Um, and Caden's entrance into their family um, brings up new layers for them to work on as well. Do you find that as an author, spending that much time with a character that is clearly struggling with grief and and uh, and has all these challenges and comes from this suddenly very very dark background, you know, after like having a fairly tranquil time coming up. I mean, we get glimpses of Caden's back background. Um, we don't spend a whole lot of time on his starting planet; just a couple of chapters before everything goes seriously awry, and then he is off planet, and you know, we're in the meat of the story. Um, but we get little, you know, glimpses of his background and coming up where it feels kind of normal, feels a little bit like farmland Americana, even though he's a mechanic, not a farmer. But And so you get the sense that he had a pretty uneventful start to things before all this happened. But spending all that time with a character like that, is that is it difficult for you emotionally to spend that kind of time, to be to sit in that headspace? Um, or do you find a kind of catharsis in some ways in working through that? I think more cathartic, but I'm, I'm someone who is really introspective. So the fact that he gets moments to sort of go internal and try and work it out, um, even though a lot of the time he's externalizing his anger and sort of rushing through things um, to not process, there are quiet moments where he gets to kind of reflect um, that 
I enjoy writing. So I, I think the balanced pacing between, you know, the, the quiet introspection and then him trying to take action where and when he can helped it not feel like a slog for me as the author in that headspace all the time because it sort of varies between these two different modes that he has. So uh, before we dig into more about the world, the, the multiverse, the, <laughs> the enormous environment of the story, um, let's talk first about just the significance of the title. Um, because first off, how brave of you to use an unusual word in your title, uh, you know, because I think you know, sometimes you're dealing with people figuring out pronunciation, people how to Google it. When it gets mentioned to them and remembering later, they have to be like, I don't, I don't know what that word is. Um, and you bravely use a lot of big, uh, big five dollar words and stuff in the story anyway. Um, but yeah, like, what can you tell me about No Fit Gloss as a title and how that relates to the story? So I think it's one of those like challenge might also be a strength, <laughs> depending things because the you know, we use this weird sci-fi world word, which immediately signals genre, which is great for a title and is sort of interesting. Like, what what is that? What does it mean? And hopefully pulls the reader in. But like you said, it's like, how do I pronounce this? Do I remember this? <laughs> if I'm telling a friend about the book, will they remember how to say it? Um, but now we're kind of, we're also locked into weird words. So for the, the two sequel titles, my editor's like, okay, we need a new space word for the first word and then like another, <laughs> and then the third one. <laughs> So then I'm like, oh, I need to come up with more weird space words that are great for a title. But I think it's sort of a good double-edged sword. <laughs> While I was drafting, the word actually just, both words popped up into my head as I was going, and I just kind of rolled with it because I was in the flow. <laughs> so I needed a name for these creatures, and no effect popped up, and it keep going. And then as I was discovery writing a lot more, and now I plot more. But then I was sort of discovering the world as I was going through it. So all right, creatures. And then I discover why they're valuable in the first place is this gloss that crystallizes inside their brain as they mature. And no effect gloss seemed like a good good title as I was just right in the, the beginning stages of this novel. But it stuck the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, so it's like literally this these sort of monstrous creatures that grow this invaluable resource in their head, and Caden and his people are pretty much fed to them. And I mean that's a spoiler, but I mean it's like when we're like three chapters in, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, something like yeah. So it's like you, you deal with it. This is the synopsis of the story, right? Um, it's a rough start for Caden. Um, but yeah, uh, so and that gives you a sense that this is an important element to the story. These things are important. This this gloss, this you know, this shiny thing that's very very valuable. Um, I would think of it in a way as sort of being comparable to like a spice in Dune or something like that. You know, where you have the, one of these elements that that um, is very very important to just the machinery of the universe working. Once Caden gets off world and you get into this multiverse, um, one we have really really crazy tech. Um, and, and, and it's a combination, it's, it's metal, it's organic things, it's gels, it, they're semi-sentient machines. Um, and, uh, and I, I was struck at right off by the fact that I was like, your, your imagination has a really high effects budget. Um, because just the sheer volume of things in the story, you could have leaned on a lot of conventions and science fiction and people's understandings of them. And instead you subvert them consistently with just very different and unique elements in the story. So, I mean, what can you kind of tell me about these environments, about this tech, about this, the, the flavor and features of this world and how you went about constructing them? As a creative, like I want to surprise myself with new ideas. Like I want to read and experience new ideas. So I'm always kind of actively trying to examine like my defaults um, while still using a framework that's familiar enough that the reader just isn't completely lost, you know, in a sea of new things. Um, but where I can and where where the story has the breathing room to try to do something new that we haven't seen before. Um, and I do this in my day job with sound design as well, like always trying to think of something haven't heard before, you know, use unusual word choices or unusual source or materials or that sort of thing to sort of elevate just the fun factor and the sense of wonder in the story as we're going through it. I wanted every location to feel unique to help the pacing out with a bigger sense of change. And I also knew that once we get off Caden's home planet, we're pretty much in ships and space stations and mega structure until the very end of the novel. Um, like thematically, he realizes that he's been indoors enclosed, a cog in a machine like his entire life. And he's freed physically in the beginning of the novel from 
this world that he was a worker in. But he's not emotionally freed until the very end of the novel where we go to this outdoor location that's like nowhere we've seen before. Um, so it has a special impact. But since everywhere in the middle of the novel is all indoors, I needed to try and be really creative to make him feel different. Like in sci science fiction, we've seen so many ships and space stations and like building settings. So how do I make everything not just like, you know, the standard metal <laughs> surface that we've seen a bunch? <laughs> Um, so I had to try to get really creative, especially with material construction and the mood of these places to make them feel different from each other um, and also hint that there's more more to the world. How do you even keep track of all that? Because, I mean, I mean, I feel like this anytime you're talking to genre writers, you know, people who are working in secondary worlds, people who are working in, you know, in big new environments, um, if you're inventing a lot of information and uh, environmental factors and, I mean, characters are enough to keep track of with their own backstories and changes over drafts and things like that. But with your environments, like, how are you keeping notes on that? What are you referring to? Like, just, you know, just how do you... How do you keep track of all that in your head? The correct answer would be that I have pages and pages of world building information written down. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm actually not that organized in my own notes about world building stuff. I have some tech and, and research, um, but in terms of like the environments and a lot of the technology, I haven't mentally left this story world since I started, so it's all fresh. And I'm going to regret later not writing everything down as I go. <laughs> For the reader, I do my best to pare things back, so I'm just not overloading them completely with so many details that they can't recognize the sort of key features of each setting um, or piece of technology. Uh, and I also always try to link it with an emotional state of cadence. So it's sort of, I think it roots in the reader's memory easier if it's, there's like a do doing double duty. Um, so they get the description, but it's also linked to an emotion or an event going on. Well, I, I like that what you, you referenced there, and I, I think it kind of dovetails with something that um, we talked about on the NYCC panel, and it's a question I like to ask on the show a lot, which is like, when you're writing a genre, how much do you lean on the conventions that the audience already knows or are, is already familiar with? You know, like, you go back to science fiction that's being write, written in the 50s and 60s, like, are a lot of you know, readers are getting introduced to these ideas for the first time. So you had to explain, oh, this is what a starship is, or this is what faster than light drive is, or what those things are. Now, most readers coming in have, you know, whether they've seen it on TV shows, they grew up with cartoons, movies, and stuff as kids, they've got some exposure to it. So you've you've got some things that you can lean on. They know what a, what a, know what a spaceship is. They know what it means to go into space. They kind of know, you know, if they've seen Star Wars or something like that, they know the, the gist of it. And usually there's a little bit you can lean on for that. Um, it felt like you made your life difficult by not leaning on as many of those things as you could. Um, and clearly there's conventions that we understand, you know, uh, but, uh, but it felt like you did have a lot to work with there. Elizabeth Baer pointed out in the, uh, um, in that discussion, the NYCC discussion that you have kind of like an archetypal, like the farm boy of the destiny in Caden. Um, and because of that, you have... Uh, a perspective that kind of gives you an ability to deliver this information for the audience. Like, like you said, um, part of it is that they basically can associate his emotional reactions to some of those set pieces. But with that, you know, fish out of water coming of age, you know, kind of viewpoint, what avenues did that give you for delivering new information, for exploring the world and, you know, using fresh eyes to deliver to, you know, fresh reader minds? Yeah, definitely starting the scope really small and on a world that's really simple and easy to understand. Like, I think most of us understand agriculture. We, everyone needs to eat and we understand like, produce food to eat. <laughs> so starting, starting the scope really simple and familiar um, and then expanding into the big world, let me pace things out easier so the reader isn't getting it all at once. Um, so like we learn about the ship's world first and then we pass through to new universes and then we see the diversity of aliens and then sort of pace things chapters apart so it's not all all at once. I think if I had tried to set the story like right in the middle of the multiverse from the beginning, there would have been too many of those things intruding at once to try to explain and then, you know, the the challenge of what to focus on for the reader at any one time. He sometimes makes you sculpt the plot in a way that's not natural because you're trying to sort of weave around like now we need to explain this or like now we need to avoid explaining that until now. And you can kind of get a a clunky mechanical plot if you're trying to manage 
your world building pacing. Um, but Caden has a pretty straight trajectory and it's like goes through layers of the world at a time. So it makes the world building pacing really easy. And yeah, because he's an ignorant character, I get to cheat and have other characters <laughs> explain things to him, which is easier, but it's like you still can't info dump, still have to paste the information out. You can't just have the character like say a whole page of like, here is how universe membranes function. <laughs> you know, so it's still a challenge to figure out the pacing. And I ended up paring down a lot of the explanation in edits. So it wasn't, wasn't as dense. And I often overestimate what the reader actually needs to hear and sometimes you get caught up in your own world building like this is so cool this thing that I made like I want to explain all of it to the reader <laughs> when when really some readers would be into that but not everyone is going to stick around for your your page of explanation of your cool science well I, I appreciate too that there's there's a couple of things in the uh in the story where uh, Caden gets uh, some shortcuts to understanding stuff and being able to um, wrap his brain around so many things. One, he basically gets universal Wikipedia in a cube. Um, and, uh, and and that immediately resonated with me because I'm like, you have all this text and later you're going to have some sort of information source. And, you know, in urban fantasy, there's always that like, OK, now we go to the library and we consult the book. Right. Like that seems to always kind of be the, sh the shtick of, of things. It's like, oh, well, we can always find that information somewhere. But like a lot of sci fi seems to ignore the ability to just, I don't know, let's just look it up, like run a search. Oh, there's the answer. You know, <laughs> like it seems missing sometimes. So um, I like that that was there. There's also an element that comes later into the novel that I don't want to go away, give away too much, um, except for I will call it a. I'm, I, in my brain, I, I think of it as the, uh, the lion o maneuver. And if uh, I don't know if you ever watched Thundercats or knew anything about that uh, as a kid, anybody in the audience might go, wait a minute, I think I might know what that means. But everybody else is looking at me right now like I'm a total crazy <laughs> person, which is perfectly OK. But it's another way of kind of advancing uh, his experience and understanding of the world without having to spend like, you know, six years of a character's life just coming to grips with like how the world works, because um, I feel like that could wear the patience um, of the audience of the readers and and your own just trying to deal with a a, uh, a protagonist who kind of can't get with the program because he's 14 years old and really mad and can't listen to anybody else about stuff. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I like I think, those I functions. It would have broken some of the plot pacing if I had, if he had been able to stop or to like take the time to actually learn things, then he would have come to his senses, right? <laughs> yeah. And I wouldn't have a I wouldn't have a plot. Um, also, <laughs> having, <laughs> also having. Um, Having like the, the universal Wikipedia thing lets you move a bunch of uh, explanation off screen. So like we we don't question later that he might know about this thing. Like no readers going, oh who who explained that to him when or like when was he exposed to that? I'm like oh he looked it up. He watched YouTube, space YouTube, and <laughs> you know, space YouTube. He's seen that or he knows how to do that. And translators was another one where you just kind of have to like put the tech in and then let the reader not worry about it again. So it was like, he has these little translators, but I didn't want that to be a huge hurdle to try to um, fumble into the net, like just trying to tell the story really cleanly. I didn't want a bunch of tech things to be intruding all the time and have to explain like, well, how does he know that? Why is that? Why did they understand? You know, you try and clip those little frayed edges off and keep it really clean. Like, be like, you know, translators exist. We got the babble fish or whatever. Like we're right. good. Don't worry about it. Let's focus on the cool stuff. Yeah, I think at any time you have, uh, especially in science fiction, um, although in certain fantasy too, like unless you, unless miscommunication is a feature, you know, like it's a part of the plot or it in some way kind of informs what's going on, the faster you can move past that, the better. I always think about like the Marvel films where you have characters in space, they're meeting aliens, they're running around with Asgardians, they all speak English, right? Like, um, and you, and you stop for a second if you're like a sci-fi fan and you're like, how do... How do they run into Star Lord and and those people and they all speak that language? You're like, hey, it's okay, it's a movie and we don't have time for that. Let's just get to it. Like, let's don't assume there's it. some function that, right? You know, but like, it's just more fun not have to, not to have to deal with that. Yeah. I also been into that with like um, thinking about: Am I going to have faster than light travel? Are we not? Like, how are they going to get around? And I went the the wormhole kind of route with these stellar aggressors that can jump from here to there just to make it in such a huge multiverse I didn't want them to spend years getting from A to B so just something to make it easier so I could focus on what the story is trying to say and not get bogged up in like 
travel times or so I do a lot of hand waving like that where I sort of don't get into it in order to keep the story focused and I think a lot of sci-fi readers will you know accept that because we've seen it a lot before and we've heard it explained a lot before so we don't need it again <laughs> yeah you don't need a preponderance of it I do think though that um that I mean you mentioning you have these these wormhole egresses um there is existing tech in this world there are um there there's a civilization that kind of existed before everybody who's there now that it, it has an enormous influence in fact it's the name of the trilogy um but um has an enormous influence um with their legacy on uh on technology, on society, on genetics, all those things. So can, what can you tell me about them and, uh, and, and sort of the, how that influences the world building and just like political structures and, uh, and just how things work? Yeah, I have a soft spot for stories that have, you know, civilization remnants from another time. Um, and science fiction and fantasy is so often about seeking the unknown, but sometimes the unknown can be in the past. Mm -hmm. And I find it really interesting to think about what was forgotten and why. Um, so the Graven are spiritually and technologically advanced civilization that it was thought to have gone extinct around the time that the multiverse bubbled off of this one central big universe called Unity. Um, but there's still a lot of secrets, like a lot not known and you know history lost and conjecture uh, around them, which we'll explore in the rest of the trilogy. And to throw myself under the bus, a lot of it I didn't know yet. <laughs> so I'm like putting in the framework for this, you know, cool backstory of the world, but I didn't have time to like completely flesh it out. So it's mysterious to the multiverse because some of it's mysterious to the author. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've since developed it more <laughs> when I had time during edits and for the rest of the books. But um, book one definitely ended up being Caden's story. And then the dressing was sort of background. But we do have um, Unity, the central universe, which has, um, it's the only place with like one governing body. Um, I, I definitely wanted the rest of the multiverse to not have any kind of overarching political government or police or, um, you know, political structure. I wanted it to have a unifying goal instead of exploration and of safety through shared knowledge of different worlds. So the, there's a widespread group called the Cartographers who organizes all of this information and incentivizes exploration by monetizing it. I was intrigued by an economy based like solely on maps and data <laughs> and exploration. So I think that works. And it also hits on a theme that I will explore more in the rest of the trilogy, which is a sort of debate between safety and discovery. Do we want one safe, predictable world with no war and known science free of disease? Or do we want a dangerous multiverse full of new experiences and unknowns to explore and profit to be made? Again, I, I keep referencing this New York Comic Con panel, and I'll, I'll put a link to it um, in the description for this, and I hope people will go check that out if they haven't already. Um, but I, I did like, I, I can't remember if it was uh, if it was Tochi or if it was uh, Christopher Polini that had mentioned that like we're in a world now where we feel like we've explored most of the planet, unless it's like basically in the ocean. You know, like there's there. There's always secrets to unlock. And there's more things to dig up. But um, in general, most of the planet we found, except for that like giant cat that was just found and like carved into the side of a mountain somewhere, which like somehow we've gone millennia with never noticing there was just a giant like terrible cat drawing on the side of a mountain. That's pretty wild. So I guess there are more discoveries to be found. Um, but like you're saying, like having these, you know, these outer rinds, these other multiverses, the new and exciting places to go that are dangerous and not everybody can venture into and that the rules are different each places. Because that's one of the fun things about this is every little sort of like micro universe that's sort of off from these other ones, the physics go wonky and they're not healthy for certain people to be in and they have big time side effects or sometimes have incredible possibilities in them. That creates a frontier for adventure um, and clearly gives you a lot of places to go um, exploring this would make a great RPG, um, you know, as for, <laughs> right. Like, I mean, just that idea of like, there's, right. there's always something new to find. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I dig that a lot. I do kind of want to know here, like you mentioned up at the top that you're a sound designer. If anybody goes and, and looks you up, I and mean, you're in IMDb under a different name, but um, but I only just the other day looked you up and had that like, oh my, oh my gosh, like that's 
that's a lot of movies and a lot of movies I know and have seen um, that you've been a Foley artist or, you know, a sound designer on, or I, I don't even know all the terms for it, but you've done all the stuff behind the scenes. You work in sound, but clearly you have a very strong visual imagination just based on everything that hits the page and no fit gloss. Um, how does your work as a sound designer um, influence your storytelling, all that time spent in film um, and in that sort of process? How has that affected your own thinking when it comes to storytelling? Yeah, I've been thinking of this more lately as people point out, like, I can really tell your, you know, film influence. Yeah, so Sound for Film is story-centric and has the same tools as I use in writing. So immersion, uh, rhythm, tension, dynamics, transitions, and fluid action. And I'm realizing more and more, like, how much I have just absorbed of those those craft concepts from working with sound, and then I apply it um, to writing, like... For example, a lot of a lot of writers bemoan transitions, like getting from play, journeying from place A to place B, or doing a jump in time. And I'm like, "What are you guys talking about? Transitions are easy." <laughs> but I realize, <laughs> I realize that I I have to manage transitions constantly in film, and I'm constantly thinking of like how to do those cuts and those jumps and like zooming in and out of space and time in a narrative. So there's little things like that that are to sort of direct parallels. I also get to see the narrative process for a film evolve because we get an earlier version of the film and are keeping up to date with it as it's changing. So, you know, character arcs are getting stronger, scenes are cut out or put in or extended, dialogues added. So I'm seeing this storytelling process happening editorially as I'm working on the sound for it. And I, I absorb a lot of craft just from seeing, you know, what the picture editor is doing and what the director's deciding and what this, where the studio is going with it. And I'm curious, do you have any artistic background, like visual arts background? Because again, the characters, just thinking about, I mean, all the different like races, even just the, the, the Azura is the, the ship um, that, that uh, Caden finds and ends up being on with this uh, group of people, the, the passenger, is it passengers, passengers? Passengers. Yeah. So the passengers were basically kind of a, they're sort of classic misfit band of found family, like <laughs> space explorers. Um, and uh, who have a lot of internal tension going on between them and a lot of backlog. Like you said, like once Caden is brought into the mix, it destabilizes some of their own personal relationships and brings a lot of things up in the forefront. You have all of these like complex creatures. I mean, some of them have like cores in their head and some have like, you know, one one person has like a body that betrays every emotion, every thought that they have and also has this sort of like cat tree creature thing that hangs around him, which again, like, like there's an obscure anime uh, called uh, El Hazard that has like this sort of cat as armor thing that I kept visualizing in my head whenever I would see it. Cool. And uh, and I was like I was like oh my gosh I wonder if she's in, seen El Hazard. Um, not that I'm it's, gonna it, watch it now. <laughs> yeah, if you can find it's super obscure it's really hard to find but uh, but the cat armor is funny. But anyway, are you an artist? Do you draw these things out? Are you just making notes of them? Like is it just something that you just have really vivid versions of these things in your head? I'm just curious because I've seen a few times that we have some crossover like an Emily B Martin who's both an artist and a and a writer. Um, maybe Jen Lyons I think might be in that same boat as well. Um, you know, like if that informs your work at all. I'm not a visual artist, but I do have synesthesia, mostly with sound um, and being neurodiverse. Like my sensory world is really rich and often overwhelming. And like um, some sensory domains cross wire. So like sound is also it's like a texture and a shape. And I kind of like I can feel the motion of it and it's really tactile. Um, so when I'm describing things and I think I have a very visual imagination just like in my head like I can see what I want to put on the page and then it's just trying to find the right words and phrasing to convey that for the reader as well um, but everything is really sort of three-dimensional in my my mind's eye but yeah the challenge is is getting translating that onto the page and like figuring out how to whether anyone is picking up what I'm putting down you know like do they, will they see it as well <laughs> am I using the right words like 
Yeah. Definitely that sense of tactile and, you know, that that the texture is there in a big way. I mean, I even like I mean, I think the great example of it is that uh, Caden has this thing called a morph coat and the morph coat changes a lot based on his own uh, emotional state or the needs of the situation. And so oftentimes just texturally that'll change. Like there's a point where it, it changes almost into scales and kind of cuts into his hands a little bit. Uh, and I remember just thinking like, oh, that the texture and feel of this sells the emotional state of this moment in a big way. Uh, in a way that it like I wouldn't have expected and I thought was very neat. So yeah, I was I was definitely curious about that. I randomly while I was I was looking up stuff about this, I always like whenever I'm getting ready for interviews, I go out to Goodreads and I read other people's interviews or uh, other people's reviews and stuff. Um and I know that can be a dangerous space uh in general. But for me it's helpful uh knowing full well like that just I occupy a space as a cisgender middle-aged white guy that um I have one viewpoint of any given story and uh, and I can use um, other people's perspectives to enlighten me about things. And I saw some people talk about the fact that there's some like, you know, there's uh, essentially kind of non-binary uh, like, you know, themes in here. You have a character named N who shifts genders pretty frequently. You have another character who is, uh, I'd say, a spectrum or maybe even that is the, the, the protagonist in a lot of ways. Um, you know, when you're thinking about that, obviously you're entering any space like this and you're thinking about those kinds of characters, particularly one that is like, is, you know, gender fluid and switching back and forth. Did that require, you know, beta readers and, and sensitivity reading and stuff like that? Like, how do you approach that? And how do you make sure that that is approached both um, in a way that makes sense for characters, and makes it interesting, but is also sensitive to the needs of, of readers and how they'll uh, interpret those things? Yeah, I do. I have a great critique um critique partner group and a lot of queer friends writers so I will I'll have them read and like do, or even they'll read but I'll also if I especially if I've done edits afterwards like to change dialogue and things like that and description I'll I'll bring it back to them like can you please check over this like am I being sensitive enough like am I overthinking am I underthinking it um, to make sure my representation is good and there's a lot of I, I really wanted to try to create a world where diversity was just the norm, like no one really questions it. There's so many aliens and, you know, different, the whole spectrum of, of gender and identity and um, appearance and skin tone and like, and I, I think I should have written that more explicitly on the page in a lot of areas because it may be my default for the world, but I realized that some readers will impose their default on it as well. So <laughs> they might not see it in the way that I do unless I'm explicitly stating it. And even like the queer identity of some of the characters or um, I did, wasn't explicit on the page because it's Caden's story and we're not really going into <laughs> everybody's backstory or um, so some of that stuff I think gets lost. But I always try and be sensitive to how I'm talking about characters in the world. And I think we're all continually trying to find our own hidden biases <laughs> and I love learning from my critique partners and you know reading about other books um, in the market now and you know what people are talking about so just trying to continually work and do better and put more representation on the page but to do it delicately and mindfully I mean I think there's two things I, I, I like as takeaways from what you just said like which which is well one is that um, I, not every time does somebody need it explicitly lampshaded, you know, like if there's something different about them, but they're just there. I mean, they just, they just exist. This is their reality and they don't have to be like, well, hey, by the way, I fit a category, you know, like I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that it's not like that because I feel like sometimes like there is that impulse. But I think particularly if you have like um, you know, straight or cisgender writers, stuff like that, they can sometimes do a little bit of the but look. I represented, you know, and like, and that feels kind of weird um, in places and, and it's often. Not, yeah. And it's not a story about a queer struggle or an, like a Caden struggling with identity, but in a much larger sense of like belonging. And like, I am a mixed race person and I always feel like I don't belong to any of the one cultures that I are my background because I'm not enough of that one um, ethnicity or that one community. Um, so Caden is also like struggling with where he fits in, like what is what are his origins? Where did he come from? But like he's um, asexual spectrum, but there's no romance in the in the novel, and the plot isn't about romance, and he doesn't have time for it. So you know his sexual preferences or whether he would be interested in romance, it like doesn't it doesn't factor in, and they don't need to talk about it because it's not what the story's about. You know you don't need to put that lampshade on just to say like, hey, <laughs> this is his label. You know. Right. No time for love, Mr. Jones. Be, yeah. Just let him be be a human in, in this world. 
Well, and the other thing that you had said is that every reader is bringing their own context to the story, and uh, and and that will flavor things. I think that the, the example I often think about is how, like, when the Hunger Games were coming out as a film, and they cast Rue, and people were like, oh my gosh, she's a little black girl. And it was like, yeah, she always was. Did you read the book? And they just glazed right over the description of the character and just assigned their own idea who that was and they got upset during the casting and had to be like it's it's in the text it's written right here like it's it's in the stuff right it's it's a thing you you kind of have to like go into knowing that um that some readers are going to catch everything that you read and a lot of other ones are going to skim over things and just assign their own ideas um or they will formulate an idea of what the character looks like or what they sound like whatever pretty early on maybe before you even get around to explicitly explaining it at some point um and by that point once it's assigned in their head it's a really hard thing to change i think so um i think that can always be uh, a challenge uh, in these stories but um but yeah i'm, I'm I, I like that that came up because i think that's always a good consideration for people is figuring out like what you know what are your readers going to bring to it and uh and how much of it do you have to kind of assemble for them early so that they don't assign their own ideas to it in a way that could be trouble you know uh, problematic for the story beyond all this stuff you said that um when you started this novel you were a discovery writer these days you're doing a little more outlining a little more plotting um do you have a writing system that you adhere to any kind of framework that helps you out um and how did that how did you evolve from discovery to a more outlining kind of system um so now i like to throw my tentpole scenes and like my general ideas at the one page synopsis structure by Susan Dennard, which is on the Pub Crawl podcast blog. It's broad enough that it's not going to corral the story at that point, but it's a great starting point for like a query letter or a pitch. And it'll show you where your gigantic holes are and what areas need more development. My plot is starting to come together. I'll, I'll throw it in that and see like, oh, you know, th this is where I need to focus and where I need to ask myself a bunch of questions. Um, but it's still broad at that point, so I have the wiggle room to like really shift pieces around and try again if I need to. And then after that, I roughly do a three-act kind of structure, which ends up being a four-act because I, I always want a really strong midpoint scene to avoid having the soggy middle. So I always try to make sure that the story is pivoting on something really big right in the middle. And then the one-third and two-third points also tend to get like some big event. So as long as I have those pieces, I know the rest, like the connective tissue in between will fill itself out just from, you know, scene by scene logic. I often don't know my climax <laughs> when <I'm> like <laughs> the end of the book. So like no fake loss, I knew what the ending scene was. Um, but I wrote the first two thirds and wasn't really actually sure how it was going to wrap up. This was more in my my pantsing days, <laughs> my discovery writing through. Um, so I took a break from it and came back and worked through from the beginning again and like figured out where he was going from there. And I think you can still feel there's like a big shift point where he physically moves locations and like has a new drive um, around that point of the novel. Um, but I also had two, I had two stories going on. I had like a coming of age, slower story about him and the crew. And then I had the revenge plot. And initially, I hadn't married them together very well. So my big editing passes were all getting getting the structure to fit the coming of age and the revenge and making sure that they were tied together in his motivations and you know, his thinking and everything that was driving him externally and internally. Um, so it was a lot of work to go from my original discovery writing <laughs> stuff to to what it ended up. And now I, I plot a lot more because there just isn't time to to you feel your way through. <laughs> I think when I was on Goodreads, I think I saw somebody from your critique group have kind of a breakdown of of having been sort of a beta reader for you on this and seeing saying that like the first version she had read was like 22 chapters and very rough, but with, you know, that had the core of it there, the bones were there, but that you went through a lot to get it to the version that it is now. But like you said, like the first novels are great because you can spend your entire life on them. You know, then when you're under contract and the second novel is supposed to come out, you need to get it together and get a novel yeah. done. So, well, and I ended up moving some of what I was going to have in book two in my original idea for the trilogy. I moved it into book one um, and moved some plot points earlier, which is a trick that I heard on the Genre Hustle podcast, 
where it's like if you're stuck, try moving, like say your climax is the new midpoint or your midpoint's the first plot point, like try moving something down and then you'll fill that, fill that later spot with something even more exciting. So I did end up sort of moving book two stuff earlier and also moving my climax a little earlier to do something different for like the big ending of the book. Um, but that helped. However, now my outline for book two has these big holes in it. <laughs> So I had to try and fill, like, shuffle everything down um, and fill that in. But it definitely helped to have material to sort of push in and, and leverage the plot better. Well, that sounds like you've, you've built yourself some challenge for the second one. I'm assuming that you're probably, like, full steam ahead working on that novel now. Uh, last question, then, um, is then, alongside all that other stuff you're talking about, especially going through all those drafts, all those changes, working on the second novel, what are your tools of the trade? Uh, what software are you using? What are you writing in? What are you keeping notes in? Uh, what analog tools? I mean, any of that stuff. I use Scrivener for pretty much everything because um, it's all in one document, which I find really clean and it's easy to hop around. And a lot of people say Scrivener is hard to get into, has so many bells and whistles, but I, I use just a few features. Like I'm not leveraging it at all, but I, I find it really easy to have everything all in one and I can you know have folders and colors and like my organizing brain really likes it. Um, and I also have all the world building and research in there and I can split screen. It's easy to sort of hop around. And the only other piece of software I use is uh, text edit on Mac because I can have sort of little floating windows <laughs> around where it's like my brain dump space or like kind of a, a clipboard <laughs> that I clean out every once in a while. But it's like where I can store things. Um, so when my brain gets messy, like little ideas for something else can all kind of live in this one unorganized document until I have time to, to grapple it. But I know it won't be lost. <laughs> I like that you said that about Scrivener because I think, yeah, people get really daunted by it because it's there's so much under the hood. But I'm like, you're going to need 20% of it, so just learn that 20%. Um, it's really, you know, it's a, a writing program that has a file folder structure built into it that makes it really easy to track your stuff. That's it. I mean, all the rest of the bells and whistles, you'll get to them if you need them. But, yeah, at the end of the day, it's just it's a tool like any other. You, you use what you need and, and uh, ignore the rest. Um, exactly. So as I, like I said at the top, uh, Nofit Gloss coming out November 17th. Um, where should, yes, thank you. I normally have the book <laughs> in hand and I left it somewhere in the house and don't I have it just, handy. Just got my final copy. So. Oh, exciting. Did you yeah. do a, uh, a, uh, I unboxing a video, video? On Twitter, yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, so where should people be following you online, uh, so they can keep up with the next books that are coming out, all the rest of the stuff that you do, um, your chatter about writing, stuff like that. Where are you at? Yeah, you can sign up for my newsletter at EssaHanson.com. I'm everywhere on social media as Essa Hansen. Um, I'm most active on Twitter and Instagram. And you could follow my author page on Facebook for just news updates and events and things like that. Well, very cool. Um, I think fans of space opera, especially stuff that's um, going to challenge their senses, make them imagine new worlds and really just kind of break out of some of the same old, same old sci-fi stuff that may they may have run across, um, should definitely check this book out. And uh, uh, Essa, it's been really fun talking to you again. Like I said, it was great talking to you at the New York Comic Con thing. Um, I really look forward to seeing where your writing career goes. And, uh, and now I'm going to be paying attention every time I see one of those Marvel movies or whatever come out and be looking in the uh, um, looking for your name in the credit sequence as well. So thank you so much for joining me on Fictitious. Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome.